remind you that St. David's Healthcare is uh, a central Texas-based healthcare system. There may be there may be St. David's elsewhere in the country. I don't know. I've never run across them, but St. David's, uh, as far as we're concerned, is a public-private partnership that exists right here in Central Texas. We are the northern frontier, as I like to say. The Georgetown Hospital is the northern frontier, and then we've got acute care hospitals and doctors' offices and tens of ten thousand people and all kinds of doctors and surgery centers and urgent care centers and all of those things that all come under the St. David's Healthcare Partnership umbrella. So when you think of St. David's, that's what we're thinking about. Um, we have a reach that goes beyond just the local area. And that is through a, a system that we call One Call, the St. David's One Call system. There are a lot of rural hospitals in Texas, as you might imagine, many very rural counties that may be fortunate to have a critical access hospital, which would be one that would have 25 beds or fewer, not a lot of complex services, but they're there to meet the basic uh, community needs. Well, when they have a, a need for higher level of care for their patients, we've established a process where they pick up the phone and we call it One Call for a very good reason. They pick up the phone, they call our 800 number, and we have critical care nurses who are staffing the phones 24 hours a day. We find out what their need is. We match that need with one of our hospitals in the St. David's healthcare system, and we get doctor to doctor conversation. And then we say, that's it. We'll have somebody there to, to pick up that patient very shortly. And so we have fixed wing aircraft. We have helicopters. We have ambulances that we will send from Victoria to the South, all the way up to, I don't even know where we go up to the North. We're, we're up in Abilene. We, we actually got a patient not too long ago from Abilene. And, um, and we'll bring those patients patients into our system and we'll take care of them up to the point where they're well enough to go home and be taken care of in their own community hospital for the, the latter part of their care. So it's been a great, great service for this entire region of Texas uh, and, and to make it as simple as we can for them. Of course, look closer to home, our hospital, St. David's Georgetown Hospital, um, many of you may know the history of this. It started back in 1917. So we actually had our, our 100th anniversary um, uh, was uh, in, in 2017. And um, it was actually formed by the King's Daughters Group, which is a benevolent organization that, that for the long time, even when I got here back in, the, in 2007, they had a um, they had a clinic up in Temple. Uh, you, so you might have heard of the King's Daughters Clinic if you've been around for a little while. And they had actually established a hospital. They called it a sanatorium. And I'm glad we did away with that name. That, you know, sometimes name changes, you sort of, you, you miss the old name. Don't miss the sanatorium name, but they had established it in a building that was right off the campus of Southwestern University. University. And when the Spanish flu came through in 1918, the first 11 patients in the hospital were um, 11 men, because at the time the school was all men. There were 11 student male students from Southwestern University. And if you read the really awesome history of healthcare in, in uh, Georgetown, um, it, it really is credited the fact that they could pull those students out of the, the, the larger population and isolate them in the sanatorium in this hospital and take care of them was credited with basically no more flu at Southwestern University, despite the fact that it was raging throughout the rest of the country and many, many people were dying. So long-standing history. I like to remind um, the folks at St. David's that Georgetown Hospital is actually older than the St. David's Hospital downtown, which wasn't formed until 1926. So they're the new kids on the block. We've, we've had a hospital in continuous operation since 1917. And it moved to its current location in 1979 on land that was donated by three physicians uh, from the community. They had, they had pooled their resources and built the hospital there. Um, and then in 2006, shortly before my arrival, it became part of the St. David's healthcare system. And that's when the Georgetown Health Foundation was sort of spun off using the proceeds from the sale of the hospital. And then in 2008, we did something called license consolidation. So if you ever see our name, like uh, if you see my logo it there says, it says St. David's Georgetown Hospital, a St. David's Medical Center facility. We actually have a, a license con, um, uh, combination with St. David's Medical Center downtown. But we're a 114 bed hospital, which in the hospital world is relatively small. It's not the smallest. Many hospitals are less than that. In fact, most new hospitals being built in the United States right now are less than 100 beds because of the trend, the trend right now away from inpatient care where you need beds and more towards outpatient. So you'll see massive facilities being built that have very few hospital beds, but almost everything else is what we would call ambulatory care. So don't be surprised if you run across a new hospital like uh, that, that's, that's huge, but not that but not that huge. 
Um, one of the things, and I could, I'm not going to run through all the accolades that we receive, but one thing that we work really hard on at St. David Church and Hospital is our safety. Um, uh, I, he, uh, Nick mentioned that I have a background in nuclear in the nuclear Navy. Um, used to sleep about 12 feet from a nuclear reactor. I'm really all about safety. <laughs> like for things to go the way. I like to have processes that work and that are repeatable and that we know we'll get we'll get the best possible outcomes. And so that's probably one of the focuses that I have in my leadership in the healthcare industry is what what can we do to make sure that things are as safe as possible. Very pleased to say that just as of about five days ago, the Leapfrog Group, which is sort of the good housekeeping seal of approval for safety scores in the United States, they uh, they gave us another A safety rating. And you can go online and look. There's a lot of great detail in this. If you go to the Leapfrog Group on their website, and you can drill into any hospital and find out how we do on all different kinds of things. Actually, our, our mothership, if you will, St. David's Medical Center downtown, is the only hospital that has an A safety rating continuously since the time that was implemented, which was back in 2008. We would have had uh, uh, an A safety rating, except about five years ago, we had a B one time because we submitted some data incorrectly and it just didn't quite get us the number that we needed. But but in the entire state of Texas, St. David's Medical Center is the only hospital that's had a, an A safety rating. And you can go on as I did and just punch in your zip code and, and it will give you the ratings of all the other all, all the other hospitals in the area. And the good news is in our community, a lot of the hospital, all the rest of the hospitals were all moving towards that ultimate experience because that's what you expect, right? I mean, you, you don't even want to have to think Think whether your hospital is safe or not, because you're going to come to a hospital in a time of need, and that needs to, you just need to make that assumption that it's safe. Well, I can promise you, you come to our hospital, we have a very low infection rate, we have very low anything that gets, uh, get, that gets combined into this. In fact, one uh, a few years ago, I think it was now 20, uh, 2013, um, that great medical journal, AARP magazine, um, had a big centerfold and it listed the 66 hospitals, uh, 66 safest hospitals in the United States. in listed on that list was St. David's Georgetown Hospital. So at least you've got that. If nothing else, at least you've got a safe place to go. How's that? <laughs> Um, in Georgetown specifically, uh, the, the St. David's footprint, we've continued to try to expand it. Um, out in Sun City, right at the market area there, we have, have had a long-standing therapy center with physical therapy and occupational therapy. That crew does a great job coming down Williams Drive. We also have a therapy center in the Lake Air site, which is where the Lone Star Circle of Care is. And the Sher we're right next to Sherman, Sherman Williams. I probably ought to say that. That's probably where you know. Um, we've got a, a great therapy team that's out there to try to make that more convenient for folks. And then as you get in closer to um, the camp, the hospital campus, uh, an urgent care center that just opened up. We've got doctor's offices right around us. Austin Heart is part of St. David. So if you uh, have a patient of Dr. Denier or, or Dr. Coley, Dr. Uh, Mack, they are um, they are part of the St. David's umbrella. Um, we also have Georgetown Orthopedic Group, which we acquired when Little River Healthcare went bankrupt a few years ago. And so Dr. English and Schwartner and Barchmet are all part of the St. David system. And then primary care, we have uh, Georgetown Medical Clinic, the long, really the legacy group that was the group of family practice doctors who established the hospital on uh, many, 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 many years ago. Um, Dr. Baumfock, many, if you've been around the town along uh, for a while, you probably know the name Tom Baumfock. He sadly retired. I said that was that that was the change of an era as far as I was concerned. And last last summer, he, he decided he's going to go um, square dance and shoot deer with bows or something like that. I don't know whatever. He had a really grandiose plan. One of those two things is what he was going to try to do. Um, and then we also have two clinics. We have uh, two senior adult clinics um, where we have internal medicine doctors who take who are specialized in taking care of patients who have Medicare, because that was one of the biggest needs I found when I got here in 2007 was people said, you would love to love to be able to align with your hospital, but we can't even find a primary care doctor who will take Medicare. Well, we have two clinics that are specifically designed and incentivized to take Medicare patients and do a great job with them. And those would be the Georgetown Center for Adult Medicine. So that's kind of our footprint right here in the local area. I mentioned the, the urgent care center. Um, care now, gosh, that could not have arrived at a better time as far as we were concerned. We opened that in November. Um just before COVID, so November of 2019, and then COVID hit in March of 2020, uh, that has proven to be a great resource for COVID testing, COVID treatment, keeping people from having to come into a hospital emergency department because they can go to a well-run urgent care center just really across the river. If you don't know where that is, it's, uh, I think First Watch says, we're, for, when they describe where they are, if you call them, where are you? They say, well, we're right next to the St. David's Care Now Urgent Care Center. At least I wish that's what they would say. I don't, I, I don't know that they actually advertise us that way. 
way. But one of the things I'll just point out about the urgent care center is if you, um, they do have extended hours and you can go online uh, and, and check in online and they will text you that they, they somehow the Google maps or whatever, they know how long the drive is going to be. They'll text you when it's time to leave your home. So you can walk into the clinic and go see the, pre the provider right away without having to wait in the waiting room. So uh, I hope you never need it, but if you do, the urgent care center is there for you. Care now, urge you. By the way, St. David's is now the largest provider of urgent care centers in central Texas. We have 16 under the care now umbrella. And I will say they are very well run organizations and um, I'm very proud to have them affiliated with us. So here's the St. David's healthcare um, model. Many of you have had to sit, sit through this slide before. I'm not gonna go into huge detail, but I do think it's very interesting um, because one of the things that we, that St. David's is proud of is that we won the Malcolm Baldridge National Quality Award back in 2014. And that was a huge thing. Any, there's, I know there's a few out here who know something about Malcolm Baldridge. And one of the reasons I think we won it was because of this unique public-private business model that we have. The Baldridge folks said, gosh, that is amazing that you can have the scope and scale of a national company and provide literally the national level care, but yet every community that you serve is benefited directly financially by the presence of St. David's Healthcare. So they're in the middle of St. David's Healthcare Partnership, and it is a partnership. Um, everything below that, that center box, that's all the assets, anything that has the St. David's name on it, the St. David's Urgent Care, our hospitals, our doctor's offices, all of those things that are owned, if you will, by that business entity, the St. David's Partnership. Well, a partnership has what? Partners, right? So we have three partners. There are three owners of the St. David's Partnership. 58% of that is owned by HCA, the largest for-profit hospital company in the world. Um, and then the other two owners are St. David's Foundation at 41% and then 1% for the Georgetown Health Foundation. We operate as HCA hospitals. The hospital I came from in South Carolina was fully owned by HCA. And so I am used to this environment. I just celebrated my 29th anniversary with that company, with HCA, uh, last week. And so um, they, they bring to us the scope and scale of a large a national company. In yet we have these two foundations. Let me tell you just a smidgen more about HCA because this is proven during a time of COVID to be a huge advantage to us and to our community. First of all, we're all over the country. Um, we've got about 100, 185 hospitals nationally. We tend to cluster our hospitals where there are um, populations. We, we don't run a lot of, of, uh, of rural hospitals. There are companies that are devoted to doing that, but we like to be in markets where we can have some market share. And what that does gives us, it gives us leverage with the um, the Blue Crosses and the Uniteds and the Aetnas when we can say, for example, in the Austin area, our market share is about 43%, I think is the most recent. So about 43% of the adults who receive hospital services in Central Texas receive them from a St. David's healthcare facility. So that's a lot of leverage when we go to a Blue Cross and say, you know, you're going to need us in your network. So we're going to have to have rates that allow us to continue to grow and to expand and to do the things that we need to do. The other nice thing about being a national company is it gives our employees some mobility. So somebody can start here, uh, and this has happened multiple times in the last two years, we'll have a nurse or a tech or somebody who's working at our hospital, and they have a need back in Kansas City where their, fam where their family is. They, they feel like they need to move back to take care of an aging parent. Well, I pick up the phone, I call the CEO there, I say, hey, this is a great nurse. Um, I think you should try to find a place for her. We do that sort of interconnection and they can continue with their vacation balances and 401k matches and all that stuff. So it's a, it gives them a lot of flexibility that they wouldn't have if we were just a locally owned and, uh, and operated um, system. We operate under different names. So like, no, you, I'm telling you HCA, but you probably might not have even ever heard of it before because we don't necessarily, here in town, we're St. David's here in, in Central Texas. If you went down to San Antonio, you would, you would recognize us as the Methodist system, which is another Another partnership between the nonprofit Methodist and, and HCA. Uh, up in Dallas, all the Med City hospitals have the, they, they're an HCA owned um, entity up there. So different names around the country, but um, all uh, managed centrally out of Nashville, Tennessee. Here's, uh, here's how this has been very valuable. One out of every 18 ER visits in the United States happens in an HCA hospital. That's a big number. That means that if HCA hospitals, ours being one of them, do something to improve the care that's delivered in an, in an emergency department, for example, pre-COVID, um, we had decided that we were going to reduce the average wait time in our hospital for the emergency room visit from, on average, the industry averages about 24 minutes. We were going to get it below 10 minutes, and we did. We actually did. Remember my billboard that had a little clock on there? Some of you have been around a while. Sadly, that had to go away when I was cutting, <laughs> cutting fun, uh, uh, my budget for COVID. 
Um, but we've got our average wait time down to below 10 minutes. Well, when HCA is able to move the needle like that in the country, we literally lowered the average wait time in ERs nationally. The whole national number dropped because one out of 18 visits. Same thing with babies. One out of every 17 babies born in the United States is born in a hospital that's affiliated with HCA. When we do something like decide that a, a, a poor clinical outcome called connectorus uh, about 15 years ago, we decided we we're going to make connectorus what we call a never event. It was something that was preventable, but you had to be very precise. You had to buy certain equipment and have access to certain lab tests. So we said across our entire system, across the entire nation, we were going to do that. And so we have basically eliminated this, this bad outcome for a brand new baby. When we did that, we statistically changed the rate of connectorus in the United States of America because we have such a large um, role in that. So that means a lot of the things that, that you're experiencing here in Georgetown, Texas at St. David's Georgetown are literally national best practices. In fact, when, when COVID hit, we, the St. David, uh, the, the HCA system um, immediately created a registry. So we started putting all of the COVID patients into a database database that is now the largest database of COVID care in the world. It is people are coming from around the world to look at the data. And when we finally figure it'll probably take many years before we finally figure out what the heck happened the last two years. But when we finally figure out the truth, the scientific truth about what worked and what didn't, much of that data you will find will come out of the HCA database. Um, in fact, we've taken care of five times more COVID patients than the next largest system in the United States. And that really played in well for us um, when COVID was first starting because given our large scope and scale. And if you may remember, I mean, it seems like so long ago, but it was like popping up in certain parts of the country and we didn't really have any and that it was kind of going all around. Well, because of the size of the company, we never ran out of PPE. We we're never really in danger of running out of PPE. Why? Because they could redeploy the assets that we had from areas of the country where there was low COVID exposure to Florida or to wherever, wherever we needed those resources. When there was a surge in El Paso and we were not in a surge here, here in the, uh, in the Austin area, I sent a whole bunch of my nurses out to El Paso to go help our sister facilities out in El Paso. And, like, and, and similarly, when there was a hurricane um, in Florida, we were able to send people to Florida to help our sister facilities out there. So that interconnectivity really has great benefit for us. In fact, I'm really pleased to say that during COVID, um, HCA didn't do a furlough. We didn't lay off anyone. In fact, we paid our nurses to stay home. We paid them 80% of their paycheck just to stay home when we didn't need them because we had stopped all of our our surgeries. And we did that because we knew this was going to get over sometime and we were going to need to have them back. And frankly, if they had devoted and committed their lives to us, we wanted to make sure that we were holding them up during this slow time. So never had a layoff, never, never reduced anybody's benefits. We, 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 we paid them through the entire time. We never ran out of PPE. And I'll have to say behind the scenes, a big reason for that is because of the, because of the HCA affiliation that we have. This is that organization I was just mentioning that, that where all of our data is now in this consortium and we have the best researchers in the country and in, and in fact around the world who are digging into this. So I can't wait to find out what happens, um, what, the, what the ultimate truth of the matter is. And in fact, uh, so let me just finish the organizational structure for just a minute. So that was the HCA side of it, 58% ownership. And then the other two uh, owners are for the 41% is the St. David's Foundation and the 1% is Georgetown. So why does that matter to you? Why, why do you care about business structure? This is not a, I'm teaching a graduate course now through Texas A&M Central Texas campus on healthcare strategy. And uh, it was really cool because I got the textbook for the course. Uh, I had agreed, I thought COVID would be done. I, was, it, I wish, I mean, it really the timing was not great for me personally, but I'm glad I'm doing it this fall. And um, when I got the textbook that I wanted to use, I was excited excited to flip through the textbook and find examples in this textbook from St. David's Healthcare because they based it, they based the textbook on best practices demonstrated by Baldridge award-winning healthcare organizations. And so one of the things was this structure. And so when you think about a partnership, you know, um, if you're maybe you're in a partnership in your business, you generate some revenue and then you keep the re whatever revenue you need to run your operations. And then if there's what we would call excess revenue or excess revenue from earnings, excess earnings, then it gets distributed to 
to the partners, the ones who own the equity in the business. So when we're successful as a St. David's Healthcare partnership, when our hospital um, earns more money than, than it costs us to provide the services or whatever, then that money goes into the partnership and it gets distributed 58% to HCA, 41% goes to the St. David's Foundation, and 1% goes to the Georgetown Health Foundation. So unlike a traditional hospital foundation model, where the foundations exist to raise money from the community to benefit the hospital, our two foundations exist to take the money that we make in the hospitals and push it back out into the community through various grant um, programs. In fact, the um, St. David's Foundation, between the two of them, they're the well, St. David's Foundation is the second largest grant giving foundation in all of Central Texas. Only the Michael and Susan Dell Foundation gives away more money every year than the St. David's Foundation does. And the Georgetown Foundation, which many of you may know, Scott Alarcon and, and Susie and Sam, there's a group of uh, folks here, which is the legacy from, you know, when the acquisition of Georgetown Hospital, um, they also are massive grant givers and supporters of our community. In 2020, uh, the two foundations combined gave away $92 million into the community. And I'll tell you, as the president of the board of the of the Caring Place, um, when COVID hit a year and a half ago, I wasn't president at the time. Uh, I was the vice president, but we all got we had an emergency meeting. And we said, "So what are we going to do?" We anticipate a massive amount of of need because people are locked into, into their homes and yet we have to shut down our store, which is our primary source of revenue, right? The, the, um, the store that we run. And we just didn't know what to expect. Well, we had had a grant from the St. David's foundation of about $250,000 to so, somewhere around $200,000 that was um, designed, it was destined to be used for case management that, cause you know, when you get a grant, it's got a specific tag on it. And very quickly into the pandemic, the St. David's foundation called and said, listen, all bets are off. We're not going to hold you to the requirement for that money. You use that to fulfill your mission, to, which is to provide for the basic, basic human needs of the people in our community. And so we did. We we're on a dime. There was a there was almost a quarter of a million dollars of resources that we had. And and I'll tell you, from the caring place, we have given away a lot of food, and the demand just keeps bigger and bigger. So please continue to support the caring place. It's been it's been an amazing thing to watch our community step up and do that. So anyway, so ninety two million, eighty nine million dollars the year before. That is money that's going back into the community, not to directly benefit the hospitals. In fact, it's they can't directly benefit the hospital. It would be recycling the money. And so if I want a new, if I, if I worked at a different hospital, the nonprofit, let's say that that didn't have um, uh, that didn't have this type of arrangement, I would have to, if I needed a new CT scanner, I would just go to my foundation people and say, hey, you know, I need a million dollars to buy a new CT scanner. And they'd find somebody with an extra million dollars lying around, would put a little gold plaque on the side of the CT scanner, and they would buy me a CT scanner. Here, my foundations are not allowed to directly benefit the hospitals. They have to be separate entities because they're taking the money and reinvesting it. So I've got to earn that money for the CT scanner. And while I'm doing that, I'm also putting money into those two foundations. So you may remember Dr. Berger, Ed Berger. He'd been the president of Southwestern University for many years. He is now the president of the St. David's Foundation. And I talked to Dr. Berger on a somewhat regular basis. And I'll tell you, his heart is still in Georgetown. And, and the foundation is very committed to supporting the nonprofit infrastructure in Williamson County. And then, the, of course, the Georgetown Health Foundation. I know many of you because I just know that this is the way you are. If you're in Georgetown, you're probably in involved in some cause other than just your business. And if you are, you know the impact that, that the Georgetown Health Foundation and the St. David's Foundations have on your two organizations. So, so all that to say, I think it's a, uh, in addition to that, um, I will, I'm sort of my final little plug for, the, for our model. Um, when St. David's acquired the hospital, one of the things that happened was, um, because we're majority for-profit, majority HCA, um, we suddenly became a tax paying entity. So unlike the nonprofit or nonprofit competitors, I wake up every morning with a tax burden that they don't have. And we brought hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars of income taxes and property taxes and other kinds of taxes that previously the city of Georgetown had not realized because it had been a nonprofit entity before that. So there's a lot of reasons why I think our model works well in a community like Georgetown. We provide exceptional care, really high level care, a safety rated care, uh, by by the way, uh, HCA ranks all of our 186 hospitals based on quality and performance and all these things. For this year, all for all but three of the months or four of the months for this year, we've been the number one hospital out of 186 hospitals in the largest hospital company in the country. So. 
So you have the uh, you have uh, you have a, a good resource in your community. I hope that's I hope I've convinced you of that this morning. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the virus. I just that picture just still creeps me out. I remember when that first came out. I thought that's some a bizarre idea of a Christmas ornament, and it is uh, uh, it is still just a weird thing. Um, of course, I, I mentioned that our our mission, and we knew right from the beginning, when, when the virus is going to change um, the mechanics of what we did. But we're still here in the community to provide exceptional care to every patient every day and to do that with what I think is the it, the character, the culture of our organization. And that is with the warmth and the friendliness and the personal pride that you experience when you come and interact with some of our staff. And so um, this is the state of COVID right now. This is as of yesterday. One of my favorite visual resources is the New York Times. And if you can look here in the in the, uh, the southeastern United States, all that yellow down there, there is we're definitely on the downside for COVID prevalence. However, if you look where the orange and the red are, they are actually going through a surge not dissimilar to what we just came out of in September or August and September, July, August and September. In fact, right now, um, there's three states in the nation, Colorado being one of them, which is just now implementing something called crisis standards of care. And we never got to that point in Texas, but we were prepared to do that. And if you read about crisis standards of care, what that is, is the you, it, it is a um, an agreed upon standard that a community will have that if you have overwhelmed your hospital resources, there's just no more ICU beds, there's just no more ventilators, these standards of care allow you to then make decisions and say, okay, I have, I have two patients down here, both of whom need to go on a ventilator. How do I choose? Not a decision that any of us in the country, certainly not in healthcare, want to do. But how do we choose? Well, the crisis standards of care, which has been implemented in Colorado, allow them to choose and say, "Well, you know, that is a that is a 55 year old um, who has four children and, and runs a business, and that is a 76 year old who has COPD and may only live five more years, even if they didn't have COVID, and decide who's going to get the ventilator." That's happening in the United States of America right now. And this has been going on now for about 12 or 14 of the last 20 months. It's gone from area to area. We never got to that point in Texas, but it's happened in a number of states that have a limited number of resources, clinical resources for their, their patients. So my advice would be, um, if you go to Colorado, wear a mask, uh, <laughs> by all means be vaccinated. If you're planning to spend, uh, if you're spend, planning to spend Thanksgiving in New Mexico, just keep some distance. Um, I'm not saying don't travel, but it's, this is a, it is really happening happening. And it is uh, just because we feel like we're out of the woods right now. And we are for some to some extent, it's pretty, um, it's pretty scary. And in, in New Mexico, Colorado, Illinois, and Minnesota. This is another one that I uh, another graph just to make a point. These are the rates for vaccinated and unvaccinated COVID cases. And this goes back um, into was it uh, April of 2020. So earlier this year, when the vaccine became pretty readily available, you can see that that top line were the number of cases of people who were unvaccinated. And the bottom line there is the number of patients who, who contracted COVID, the average daily census in hospitals. So it's not just the people who got COVID, but the ones who had, ended up being sick enough to go into hospitals, the fully vaccinated is that lower, that lower graph there. So the unvaccinated people getting sick enough to go into a hospital was six times as high as the vaccinated rate. If you ask me whether the vaccine works, I'm going to tell you unequivocally the vaccine absolutely 100% works. And in fact, this is even more chilling. This is the death rate, the average daily deaths. The average daily deaths of the unvaccinated were 12 times as high as the unvaccinated, I mean, as the vaccinated people. So did people die who got the vaccine? Yes. In most instances, based on our experience and when everything that I've read, if you were vaccinated and you died of COVID, it's probably because you have a whole bunch of other comorbid conditions. You are probably set up to not have a good outcome with any respiratory illness and COVID just happened to be the one that 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 took you out. And that it is such a sad thing. In fact, we dealt with this for a long time for this entire last surge. Yet all these unvaccinated, our, our hospital was filled with unvaccinated patients and we're happy to take care of them. We're not in the business, if we didn't take care of people, if we, if we made the decision, we're not going to take care of you because you made a choice that got you here, so to say. 
we would have no one in our hospital because most people in the hospital are there because of a choice they make. They're obese. They have diabetes. They have, you know, there, there's things that we just do as, as human beings. So we don't sit in judgment of anyone. That's not our role. Our role is to take care of the people who get sick. But it was very sad to see the, the destruction that happened in families when people who had the opportunity to get vaccinated and chose not to do that. Um, it is happening around the world too, just, just so that you're aware. If you look there in Central Europe, um, lots and lots of COVID. They are actually going through another pretty, we're, we're, we're watching it very carefully. In fact, this might show you, um, this is the European um, uh, uh, or the global, the global surges. So you had three surges. We've gone through three surges. I'll show you, show you that in just a minute. Um, and now we're starting to see globally it ticking back up and we're really nervous, hoping that it will be mitigated. It shouldn't be as bad as it, as it was in the past because now there's enough vaccination worldwide. But there's something else coming. Winter is coming, as they say, and we're seeing that on the horizon um, globally. If you look to the gray graph that's on the left-hand side, you can see that's the de COVID deaths. And see how instead of it turning up there to the far left-hand side, it's sort of flat. That's a direct result of the, the amount of vaccination. So people are getting sick with COVID, but they're not dying of COVID nearly as much because we're getting the vaccine out there. Um, if I have not, let me just say this. I'm a big fan of the vaccine. Um, not so sure I'm a big fan of mandating the vaccine. We're kind of struggling with that at our hospital right now because our company had chosen to allow vaccines to be voluntary. And now under the, the recent regulations, both the OSHA and the CMS regulations, we're, requiring, we're forcing our staff to get the vaccine in order to be employed because the government's based basically said, oh, you don't have to get them vaccinated, but if they aren't vaccinated, we're not going to pay you to take care of Medicare patients. And about 70% of my patients are Medicare. So that's a non-starter right from the beginning. They, you know how they, uh, um, they know how to get us to do what they want us to do. And that was to sh to deal with the money. Um, so here's, here's what it looked like here in Georgetown. You can see we had three surges. We had one, sur one uh, surge one and surge two. Last summer, summer of, 20, uh, uh, of July 2020 was the first sort of surge. We thought that was going to be the end of us there. It was completely exhausting. We caught our breath for a few months. And then last winter, we had another massive surge. And that was, that was really incredible. We have a 10-bed main ICU in our hospital. And in eight of the those 10 beds, we had two patients in each room just to make room for these patients. I mean, that, that's that's how bad it, everybody was on ventilators and all that stuff. Um, and then it slacked off and we thought we were going to be out of the woods. And then all of a sudden at the beginning or the, the middle part of this past summer, right after the July 4th holiday, it start, started to peak again. And we got we got this, this surge that we're just now coming um, out of. And you might think, okay, well, these are just the normal ups and downs. This is not normal ups and downs of healthcare. This is exhausting. It's resource intensive. And when you have been beaten up for three times in a row like this, when you've, when, when, when I've asked my ICU nurses and my respiratory therapists to work eight days in a row, because I don't have anybody else to backfill them. And you do that for months at a time, even if you give them a month or two off where they only go back to, to three shifts a week. Um, and another one hits, frankly, it's becoming really, really hard to, uh, to manage these. I'm watching very carefully that little red circle down there at the bottom. That's the last few weeks we and anticipated. The models all showed us going back down to near zero by this time. I looked this morning before I came in. We're actually kind of back up. We're, we have a higher COVID census in our hospital now this week than we did last week. It had started to drop and now it's starting to come back up. I do not predict another massive surge, but I do predict that people need to get vaccinated because we're going to need to try to keep a lid on this as much as we possibly can. Um, one of the reasons that our hospital has done so well and have, has had a, actually had a high COVID census is because of this group. I was very pleased and honored that the chamber last uh, two weeks ago honored our pulmonary and critical care group with the cornerstone, healthcare cornerstone winner. Uh, this is be Dr. DeCaretree, Dr. Fields, and Dr. Wynn. Um, we had always been known as a great hospital for critical care. Some of you visited my ICU when we did our grand opening a few years ago. We built that around the foundation of these three physicians. And so even before COVID, we had to put a helicopter pad on our campus because we would fly patients in from around the state of Texas who had advanced respiratory illnesses. And our doctors were some of the only doctors in the state who could take care of them, who could do interventional pulmonology work. And so when COVID hit, our systems 
strategy was right off the bat, we didn't know how big it was going to be, but we knew Georgetown Hospital within the St. David system had the, ref had the reputation as being sort of the best for taking care of respiratory illnesses. So we became a, um, a hub hospital. And so even the big hospitals downtown, St. David's Medical Center, North Austin Medical Center, if they got a COVID patient in their ER, they would transfer them to us for us to admit and take care of. And I'm really pleased to say that eventually that, that strategy stopped working because there was so much COVID in the area. Everybody had to, uh, everybody had to take their own COVID patients. But um, as a result of, of these doctors and their leadership of the nursing staff and just the whole overall reputation and experience that we have, our COVID mortality rate, and I can't give you real numbers, but I'm going to tell you that I know the real numbers, is significantly better significantly better than any other hospital in Central Texas. And we are amongst the very best in the nation um, based on our uh, comparatives with HCA. So in other words, you had a much better chance of coming out alive if, with a COVID diagnosis out of St. David's Georgetown Hospital than if you had gone to just about any other hospital in the, in the region. So uh, um, sadly, for months at a time, we were having to deny patients coming in from out of the area. We would have a long list of people who wanted to come in from all over the state but we couldn't take them because we had to be able to maintain the capacity we, for, the, for people from Georgetown who showed up in the ER. So those doctors were the, the reason. They provided the leadership. They wrote the orders. They stayed up on all the latest and greatest things and used the right medications and, and had just great outcomes. Um, as a result of that and just sort of the growth of the future, we're actually in the process right now of expanding our ICU. By the springtime, we should have four more ICU beds, which will take us to a total of 20. I have 114 total beds in just a little bit less than 20. 20% of my whole capacity is going to be ICU. That's weird for a small hospital. Most hospitals have a few ICU beds, and then most of them are general acute care beds. Not, not here. We are known as a place that the sickest of the sick can get the best of the best care. And so, um, again, I hope that gives you confidence that if you get sick in this community, just ask any ambulance driver. If you got a respiratory illness, where do you want to go? They will, they will bring you to our hospital. Um, some other things that's happened during COVID and just wrap up here kind of quickly with a few things. One, we have uh, uh, some of you just before COVID came and played on our robot, right? We did a little uh, robotic surgery in our main lobby. Um, we we're really excited to get that. Well, we upgraded that equipment at the very beginning of, of last year. We, we went to the latest platform, which is called the DaVinci XI, and we have been become such a large robotic surgery um, hospital that now we're adding a second robot. So I have four ORs, two of them, half of my surgical capacity is going to be devoted to the absolute cutting edge robotic surgery. So we've got doctors from Austin coming up to use our robots because they love the way when the patient is, uh, is taken care of after the surgery, when they go up onto our floors, they love the way our nurses take care of the patients um, in, our, uh, in our hospital. Uh, another thing that just opened last week, we have a new interventional radiology lab, about a $4 million project that we've been working on. These are things um, in the, a pretty wide range. It's a very specialized equipment that you buy. Kyphoplasty, which you might be familiar with, it's a spine procedure with kind of rebuilding a, rebuilding spinal uh, the spinal column, um, doing blockages of blood clots. If you've got uh, 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 prostate glands that are inflamed and, or there's blood clots in those, they can go in and do some really micro level um, work in these things. They can put filters in veins and arteries to try to keep you from getting strokes. This is not a capability that we have had up to this point. In fact, this has been the primary reason if we've had a really critically ill patient in our, pa in our hospital, we had to transfer them. It was almost because we almost always because we didn't have the ability to do these very, very specific procedures. So now we have that capability. It's one less, one less thing that we're going to have to transfer somebody out of our hospital to take care of. Two great doctors who are kind of leading that program. One is an interventional radiologist by the name of Dr. Van Cura. Actually, Actually lives in Old Town and is basing his practice in Georgetown. So I think we're going to become kind of a dominant player in this world. He has two fellowships. One was vascular and, interna and interventional radiology from UCLA. And then he also was at Cedar sinai which is one of the biggest neuroradiology fellowship programs in the United States. So incredibly well qualified. This guy could have gone anywhere in the country. He chose to want to live in Georgetown and be able to do the program at our hospital and grow us in large part because of the reputation of our ICU and working with the doctors on our medical staff. And and then we also have a cardiologist, Dr. Pandia, who is um, uh, going to be doing uh, cardiology procedures. We're not going to do 
heart caths. So this is not where you're gonna get stents and cardiac procedures, but this would be everything else, all the other peripheral vein and arterial work. And then uh, something that we, re got, we got going again at the beginning of this year, we, had, we used to do spine surgery. We lost our spine surgeon. Now we, we uh, again, this was just a gift, I think. Dr. Ivan Chang, who was the full professor of orthopedic spine surgery at Stanford University, which is one of the best spine programs in the United States. They got tired of living in Northern California. He told me, listen, I don't, I can't raise my children here in the San Francisco Bay Area. I need to go, I need to go someplace else. He moved to Austin. And so he has an office here in Georgetown. He's doing surgery at our hospital. This guy is amazing and he's a really, really nice guy. So if you if you are in need of an of a spine surgeon, um, this I would highly recommend Dr. Chang. You can call over to the Georgetown Orthopedic Office or Austin Spine and you can get to see him. Oh, is that oh, I lost that one? Is that my, my timer? Does that mean I can't uh, am I done? Okay. Okay, I only have one more slide anyway. So then I'll finish. Um, the other thing, I just want to use this as a, since I've got a crowd of you here to, to remind you about strokes. And the reason I say this is it is true. And I'm sure you heard this. There were a lot of people who put off a lot of care during COVID. They were afraid to come to the hospital. Um, they didn't get their regular mammograms or, you know, GI procedures and all that stuff. And we are starting to see people who are much sicker than they needed to be. Had they gotten routine preventive care for the last two years, we don't think we would have seen that. One of the saddest things that we see is when people were afraid to come to the hospital and were experiencing strokes in their homes and didn't choose to come to the hospital. They, oh, it'll go away. The droopiness in my face, the slurred speech. And, and there is a time limit when you start getting stroke symptoms. There is a time limit before you can do some pretty major life-changing interventions. Um, we, we talk about in a, in a heart attack, time is muscle. So the longer your heart isn't working and it doesn't get the, the blood that it needs, the, the heart muscle itself starts to die. Well, we say time is brain when it comes to a stroke. You need to, if you start seeing these types of symptoms in any person, a balance, trouble walking, if there are eyes that they can't see in one eye or, or both eyes, the, the, I mean, this be fast is the acronym, right? Facial weakness, you can actually, and I sat in a meeting one time, it was one of the scary Things. literally sitting in a meeting with a couple of people across the table from me. And I saw a woman's face ju just start to droop on one side. And I thought, well, that's really odd. I didn't know if it was makeup. I really was completely weirded out. I'm sitting next to a doctor and he looked at her and goes, you're having a stroke. And she goes, oh, wrong, wrong. And she was, she was having a stroke and we were able to get her downtown, get downstairs into the emergency department and take care of her right away. Arm weakness. Um, speech problems, a little bit of sur a slurred speech, the a, tie, a, a bad, bad headache that you just don't usually get a headache like that. Any of those symptoms, please, 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 please call 911. If you're, and, and if you're a wife and it's your husband experiencing those, those symptoms and they refuse to call 911 because that's just how we are, um, drive them to the hospital if you have to. I mean, whatever you've got to do as quickly as you can, because we have a teleneurology service that we have. We bring a doctor in, that's a, that's a piece of equipment where we have a neurologist sitting by 24 hours a day who within minutes can be doing an evaluation um, and we can get you a CT scanner. And if it's an appropriate thing, we can get you that clot busting drug. And I've watched people and I'm not a clinician, you know me, but I've, I've been down there and I've seen a patient come in by ambulance who was in a full-blown stroke and 30 minutes later, they were having a regular conversation because they got the clot-busting drug in time. So don't wait for your care. There's no reason to be afraid of the hospital. We are a very safe, A-rated. Did I mention A-rated? Um, we are a very safe place for you to come. We're going to get you in very quickly. We're going to take exceptional care of you. And we're going to do it with the way, with the Georgetown way, with warmth and friendliness and personal pride. So uh, there, I'm done. I did it in with four minutes. I know you needed 10 minutes, but ah, you gave me the microphone. Um, but uh, uh, hopefully that was interesting to you and you got a little you know, update on some things. And uh, could I take one, at least one question? Do I have enough time for one question? We'll do one, question. one question. All right. Who's got the question of the group? Anybody? Yes. Are y'all going to be starting a study on the long-term effects of COVID and how it's interacting? And I noticed a lot of people in their 50s and stuff. Uh, yeah, so she's asking a question about um, about long COVID and long-term effects. Yes, there's a lot of longitudinal studies going on. And the good news is the database that we have of people who are diagnosed and came in the hospital will be able to track those through the system for a while. So I think that's going to be that's going to be the future of COVID is we're going to try to figure out what does this mean for us in year two, in year three, in year four, in year five. And I think it's going to be a little more devastating than we had hoped. It's not it's not the flu. It's well, it's well worse than that. So anyway, so thank you very much. I appreciate your attention.